Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. A coroner is a government official who investigates human deaths. The coroner's office usually has the responsibility to determine the cause of death, issue a death certificate, and maintain death records. Local laws define a death the coroner must investigate. Those include deaths that are sudden, unexpected, and have, uh, and have no attending physician. A coroner will also investigate a death which is suspicious or violent. Depending on a state's laws, a coroner may determine the cause of death personally or may act as a presiding officer of the coroner's jury. Our guest today is Steve Nunn, the coroner of Madison County, Illinois. Coroner Nunn was first elected in 2000 and was re-elected in 2004 and 2008. Prior to his election as coroner, Steve Nunn was lieutenant in the detective division of the Madison County Sheriff's Department. He's also served as a member of the St. Louis Major Case Squads from 1980 through 2000. Steve Nunn, welcome to Conversation. Thank you, Lee. So you've been in law enforcement basically your whole adult life. Yes, I have since age 21. And as a law enforcement officer, you saw the crimes on, <laughs> on the crime side first. And then what made you decide that you wanted to switch over and uh, uh, approach from the coroner's point of view? Well, it's... Um it's interesting, 26 years with the sheriff's office, mm -hmm. and um, during that time I worked closely with the coroner's office on death investigations. So I got to know the mechanisms of the coroner's office, the investigators, uh, it was a great staff of people. And so at uh, the end of my 26th year, I was eligible to retire from the sheriff's office. The coroner at that time, Dallas Burke, was getting ready to retire, and I thought, you know, I, I, this could be something that I could do because it is also a law enforcement agency. Uh, they have the same arrest powers as the sheriff does. So it was an easy uh, transformation for me to go from sheriff to the coroner. Uh, you're basically doing the same thing. So uh, with that, uh, I uh, sought the endorsement of the party and uh, got that and then ran. And, and unfortunately, the citizens elected me in 2000 and, and I've been the coroner since then. Mm -hmm. You're not a, a medical doctor. No. Uh, in Illinois, the coroner does not have to be a medical doctor, uh, but I have four uh, medical doctors that work for me. Two are forensic pathologists and two are clinical pathologists. Uh, the only county in Illinois that has a medical examiner system, which does require you to be a, a, a physician, would be Cook County. They do have a medical examiner's office, which is different from a coroner. So I was going to say, there seems to be two different systems here. Mm -hmm. There's the coroner system and the medical, uh, medical examiner system. Right. Mm -hmm. And the medical examiner system is headed by a, a physician. Right. What's the difference? Well, the only real difference is uh, the uh, medical examiner is appointed by that government body. Oh, uh, appointed. Yeah, and it's you, appointed. And you're elected. And I'm elected. Uh, they are, uh, do the same thing we do as far as determining cause and manner of death. Uh, assisting law enforcement, you know, in, in uh, collecting forensic evidence uh, to assist in any criminal investigations. Uh, the main difference really is is that one is headed up by a medical doctor and one is headed up by a law enforcement official, uh, but we both are actually achieving the same means. Yeah, in getting ready to do this, uh, this uh, discussion with you, I looked up a little history on coroners. Apparently this has a, this word has a very, very long history. I mean, mm -hmm. it goes back in English history all the way into the uh, late 1100s. Yes. And I believe even mentioned in the Magna Carta as well as one of the officials. Mm -hmm. um, so here you are an elected official, and but you really don't act, I mean, you don't go around slapping backs and, <laughs> and doing all the political stuff, uh, at least not that's not your main job. So why don't we just start from the very beginning. What is What is the job as you perceive the coroner of Madison County? Well, number one, obviously, is we are there to investigate suspicious deaths. We do not investigate all deaths. So mm -hmm. deaths of people who die before they should, uh, and then deaths that are mandated by law that we investigate, like uh, any infant under the age of two, any death in a state-run facility, whether it's a jail, prison, 
state mental health facility. Um, and then, of, of course, any work-related, job-related deaths, and uh, then accidents, suicides, homicides. Those are, are what we're involved in. When you use the term investigate, what, what exactly does that, does that mean in the real world? Uh, what you see from us is what you would see on, on any television show. We, we go in with our, our cameras, we take photographs, we collect evidence, we interview witnesses, uh, and then we, we go into the scene to assist law enforcement. So you have your crime scene people, they have a job to do. Mm -hmm. The coroner's investigators have a job to do, and then your police department or sheriff's office has their job to do. You walk in that scene as a team. We all know what we're doing. You know, uh, Any evidence that's on that body belongs to the coroner. The, the body cannot be touched, moved, or any evidence removed from that body until the coroner so deems so. Uh, and then uh, we will take that evidence, collect it, and then turn it over to the proper authority, whether it's the crime scene people or that law enforcement agency. Uh, so that's our evidence to collect. Again, we have to photograph it, document it, collect it, and then make sure it gets to the right uh, agency. And then from there it goes to your forensic labs for further examination. Mm -hmm. So it's a team effort. Uh, and, and, and in this county, uh, we work extremely well with law enforcement and crime scene people. Well, let's just assume that uh, uh, somebody knocks on somebody else's door and there is no answer, and there should be. And they get in and then here's a body, let's say drug overdose, mm -hmm. okay. So there's been a drug overdose, the body's in bed, somebody calls the police and says, oh God, there's somebody dead in the bed. Okay, what happens then? Well, then uh, the police will, will uh, respond. Then if they determine there's a dead body at that location, they immediately, by law, have to notify the coroner. That, that's, in fact, that's the specific. The police do. The police do. Once you know where a body is <coughs> located, then your next step is to notify the coroner immediately, and then our office will respond to that scene. Mm hmm Okay. So then you come in, and just like on TV shows, you carry in all these big bags, and, right. and, and you're looking for, at that moment, what? Well, we're looking for forensic evidence to help us determine what caused that man's death. Whether there's, if it's a drug overdose, then we're going to be looking for evidence of drug usage, pill bottles, uh, syringes, uh, tubing if they're shooting up, uh, that kind of stuff. Anything to support, to help support how did this person die and why did this person die. Mm -hmm. And again, everything is, is, is photographed, documented, collected properly, packaged properly. Uh, and then taken uh, and sent to our forensic lab here in Fairview Heights for further analysis. Mm -hmm. So then after, uh, so after you've collected all of this, this evidence, <clears throat> you don't necessarily remove the body right then. I mean, you're working with the police at yes. this point. So when everybody decides that that's, you know, that, okay, we got everything, we, it's all documented, then what happens? Okay, then we will remove the body from the scene uh, normally, this is your team or you this have? This is my team. This right. is your team. Well, I mean, we have people who will come and take the body for us. Then we would normally take it to a local hospital, have it x-rayed to see what we can see uh, from that point of view. And then from there, it will go to the uh, morgue where an autopsy will be scheduled, uh, usually that day or the next, and then we proceed from there. Mm -hmm. And when we say proceed from there, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm trying to get, you right. know. Oh, that's fine. Well, the then uh, we will here. contact one of our uh, forensic pathologists. They will come in. The autopsy is done. Law enforcement will, will be present. Wait. So people hear the term autopsy, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's not, it's not really well described to the public. What, mm -hmm. what, what are we talking about? Well, the about literal here? term is to see for oneself. That's the literal translation of autopsy. That I see, you're looking and visually examining the body to see what is what artifacts are on that body mm -hmm. that's going to help lead you to determine the cause of that death. So if there's bruising, you're going to measure the bruising, you're going to photograph the bruising, you're going to document the bruising. It's a very uh, uh, protocol process. There's a step-by-step -step process, beginning with just taking the picture of the body as it lays on the table. Then there's the undressing of the body, collecting of the clothes, packaging the clothes, then noting any injuries on the body, photographing that, documenting this. Uh, then the actual autopsy will begin where the, where the chest is opened up, organs are examined. Uh, if it's a case where there's a bullet wound, obviously that is, is also uh, photographed, measured. Uh, you try to do the trajectory to show entry, exit. Uh, 
All that again is carefully documented and photographed during the course of the autopsy. If there is a bullet to be re removed, they will remove the bullet, package it, and then also send it to the, to the laboratory. But it's a very step-by-step uh, uh, -step process from beginning to end. Uh, and, all, and then during that process, also different uh, tissues are collected from the organs. They will be examined at a lab. Uh, fluids are taken, uh, blood, urine, and, and uh, vitreous, which is your eye fluid. Those are taken, will be sent to the lab, and that's for uh, drug analysis, alcohol analysis, uh, to see if there's uh, any illegal uh, or even prescriptive medications uh, in the system. Uh, Why the eye fluid? The eye fluid is actually the most accurate. It's more accurate than urine or blood to give you uh, uh, an alcohol or a, dr a, drug, a drug breakdown. Really? Yes, sir. Oh, how interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the, the next question is, the work that you do, uh, there have been TV shows, so, and unfortunately so many people see TV shows and substitute reality for the mm -hmm. TV shows. I believe there was one at one time called Quincy. Yes. Um, was that fairly accurate compared to the work that you do? Or Actually, Quincy was pretty accurate. They, uh, they uh, did that in, in consultation with the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office, so they were pretty accurate. Uh, the things that are misleading is the uh, ability to get things done as fast as they do. We only got an hour. Yes. <laughs> they, uh, I mean, they, you know, they, they're taking blood from a body, and an hour later the lab's calling and saying, there's cocaine in the system, there's heroin in the system, and in reality that just doesn't happen that How way. How long are we talking about to really get some results back? Eight, ten weeks. Weeks? From, weeks from our toxicology labs to get results back. Is that because they're backed up or yes. it actually takes that long? No, that's because they're backed up that bad. They're, so, they're I mean, backlogged that bad. I mean, let's say some high official is, is assassinated or something and you need this information. Mm -hmm. How fast are, is the turnaround? Well, it depends on again on what you're looking for because some of the test does, you know, has to set 24 hours before you go to the next step, before you go to the next step. So it's hard so for it's me to say days. that. So it's still days. We're still, still talking days. days. Yeah, you're not going to get it in an hour or two. Right. Uh, but if, if it was something that was high profile and needed to be done uh, quickly, uh, you, you may be able to get it within a week. Mm -hmm. A week. Mm -hmm. Okay. DNA. Here's another miracle, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that on TV shows, you know, you've got that in a matter of minutes. W what's the real story on DNA? DNA is the same way. It's, uh, it's a 8 to 10, sometimes 12-week process to get to, for that to get back. Mm -hmm. And how often are you doing DNA uh, in one of your investigations? Well, it, it's, it, the DNA part, uh, if it's a homicide investigation, and then we're going to be trying to match blood uh, at the scene, then every, every homicide is going to have DNA submitted for analysis uh, samples. But in, in a, just a, a suicide or a traffic crash where we're not really trying to look for a suspect or try to put anybody in jail, then we're not going to... We're not going to do DNA again. It's an extremely expensive process. Number one, is it really? And yes, and then it's also a lengthy process. So, so if, if if it's not necessary, if we're not if we're not really looking at a criminal prosecution, then then the autopsy would not include any DNA uh, examination. When you say expensive, could you give the audience some idea of what we're talking about? Well, a thousand, twelve hundred dollars, really, mm -hmm. per sample. Mm -hmm. And is that like, do you take more than one sample of, st of things at, at a crime scene? Oh, absolutely. So yes. that's yeah. a thousand bucks per sample. No, it's just, it's oh. just, yeah, whatever they de deemed, they're going to take one of, those, one of those samples and that's what they'll run the DNA on. Mm -hmm. And it can be blood, urine, uh, uh, saliva, and in some cases when you don't have that, so you have a badly decomposed body and you have none of those fluids because it's all gone. Mm -hmm. Then you have to like take a long bone out, like a femur, and then submit the femur, and then they'll do the DNA on the femur. They take it out of the, uh, uh, the what do you call it, the part inside the bone. The, mm -hmm. the marrow. Forget, the marrow, thank you. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of that term. Um, Illinois is well known because of uh, uh, death penalty cases, that there have been some, some people who have come off of death row because when DNA was looked at later on, it was like, oh, didn't match. Mm -hmm. um, the investigations that are done now, will there be such cases in the future, would you think? As a law enforcement guy and a coroner, would you think that there would be those kind of errors in the future? There shouldn't be, because you, we do have that DNA analysis now. 
back when I started, what you had was blood type. That's the best that you could do. And that only gave you like 51% of the population. Hey, we found uh, type B at the scene. Our suspect has type B. That only, 51% of the, of the country had type B. Mm -hmm. But it was at least a piece of the puzzle. Okay, blood B at the scene, type B, and, and he, he's got it. And now with DNA, it's his chances of not being the person is one in one billion. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how you went from blood type to DNA and how, more, how much it, it narrows it down to you're the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these cases back you know, 20 years ago, they were just using blood types. And that's how you're getting wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're mostly talking and focusing here of late about criminal investigations, but that's not, that you said earlier, that's not all that you do. I right. mean, you're, you're any kind of a violent or suspicious or unknown death or something that, that the legislature says is mandatory, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so uh, of, of the deaths that occur, what percentage, is that like the vast majority? The, the ones that are not criminal? Yes, yeah, that, that's the vast majority. Suicides, again, traffic crashes, uh, job-related deaths. You know, we're in there, we're, again, working hand-in-hand -hand with OSHA. Mm -hmm. If it's a job, on-the-job death, we're gonna go in there, not only to determine the cause of death, we're gonna look at what was going on and, and what can be fixed in the future. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with suicides, uh, to make sure that, uh, that it is a suicide, that it isn't a homicide that was made to look like a suicide. That's part of our job. The coroner's job, make sure somebody doesn't get away with murder. How often have you in your career ever seen something like that? Or people tried to get away with murder? Well, or, you know, make a, a suicide, or make a, a homicide look like a suicide. Uh, it, it's happened two or three times. Uh, where it's really common is infant deaths, or where they've shaken a baby to death, they've beaten a baby to death, and then they try to tell us, oh, the baby fell off of a high chair, uh, the baby, we were swinging the baby and the baby fell off the swing. Uh, and through our knowledge, our investigation, forensically, we know by looking at that baby that the story they're telling us is a complete lie. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and part of the coroner's job is to speak for the dead. The dead can't speak for them. My job as the coroner is to be able to speak for that dead person and say, hey, they're crying out, you know, this is not what happened to me. You know, uh, this has been a homicide. And, and so through our experience, through forensics, through uh, the evidence that's at the scene, we're able to put together a case that says, you're lying to us. Uh, a perfect example is a case where we had where our parents were calling us, the baby just died, we were, were giving it CPR, please hurry, get to the scene. Uh, he's not breathing. Okay, we get to the scene, and as we look at the baby, <clears throat> there's a, when you die, your blood stops pumping, okay, mm -hmm. and it settles. It's not moving anymore. Well, what is it does is it discolors your skin and turns it purple, okay, and it's called lividity. At the lower Yeah, it, it's, lower just, it, it's just, it just seeks its low, lowest level. Mm -hmm. So if the baby is laying on its back, in an hour or two, you're going to get that purpling discoloration on the back, okay? It doesn't happen as soon as you die. Mm -hmm. So here you've got parents saying the baby just now died, we're giving it CPR, please hurry, hurry. they're calling 911. We get there and we turn the baby over and there's lividity, which is telling us that baby's been dead for two or three hours. Mm -hmm. So this has all been an act for us and for law enforcement. So it's those kind of cases, especially that are satisfying to us that we uh, find somebody that uh, is trying to get away with murder and they don't. Uh, and in that case, believe it or not, uh, we've, with infants happens more than you would think. We're, They've, they've injured that baby and then come up with some uh, a story of how that injury occurred and then we can prove beyond a doubt that that story uh, could never happen that way. Mm -hmm. And they tell you these stories because what, they're, they're scared of punishment or they're regretful or? It, it, yeah, I mean, they, in, in most instances, they didn't mean to kill the baby. Uh, they were angry, so they're taking the baby and they're shaking it. And the shaken baby syndrome is one of the, the, the ways that, that, that a baby is going to be killed inadvertently. And again, the parent is not trying to kill the baby, but they're just mad at the baby and they're shaking. Well, that brain is being moved back and forth inside that head and it's basically sloshing and hitting the front of the skull and the back of the skull. And it's going back and forth and you're causing damage to that brain as you're doing that to that baby. And it's called shaken baby syndrome. So they've accidentally killed this baby, now they're scared. So now they've got to come up with an excuse. So it's, he was playing and he fell and he hit his head on the coffee table. Those kind of stories. And mm -hmm. again, we can prove forensically and through that autopsy that story isn't going to hold water. 
So we'd love for you to tell us that story. Keep telling it to us. Lie to us as much as you can because you're just burying yourself when you do it. So it's not like something, you, you're lying, look at this <laughs> lividity. Right. Under there. We don't say that right away. Right. We let them keep talking and, talk and, and let them go ahead and bury their own, their own grave, mm -hmm. so to speak. Until they call their attorney. Right. But we'll, we'll just let them keep talking, and then we know that they're lying, and we'll encourage them. You know, and, then, and then what happened, and then what happened? We're not going to stop and say, oh, you're lying, we know that because. There's no way we would do that. We're going to let them continue to tell that story as long as they want to tell it. We know that they're, they're telling us a lie, but we're going to let them go ahead and, and let that lie bury them. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so now you have, um, you've gone through the whole, pro you've processed the body, or I should say the medical People have, the pathologists have processed the body. Mm -hmm. Now you're all done, okay? At what point do you make a decision to release the body? On homicides, we always normally put a 72 hour hold on a body. That's just in case as law enforcement continues their investigation, something else may pop up and go, oh, we need to go back. You know, the, the suspect's given us a statement and said, this happened. So we can go back and look at the body. Oh, sure enough, you know, we missed it, you know, so. We try to hold it for 72 hours. Another advantage is sometimes bruising will continue to develop even after, after death. So something you might, especially on a baby, you may not see it that day, but you take, take, take the body out the next day and look at the body again and you'll start seeing bruising develop. Mm -hmm. You know, whether and they're grab marks or choke marks or that sort of thing. And a non-crime um, death, how long before you'll release As soon that? as, soon as the autopsy's uh, done, then we'll call the funeral home and have them come and get the body and how immediately. Long, how long, is it, from the time that it arrives in, you said in Wood River mm -hmm. is where this is done? Right. From the time that the body arrives in Wood River, about how long are we talking about before release? An autopsy takes uh, about an hour, hour and a half. Oh, that's it? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so, very quick. Right, yes, if we, if we got a body in at 10 in the morning, had the autopsy at one in the afternoon, we could be releasing that body to the funeral home at four that afternoon. Mm -hmm. On occasion in the news, there are talks about, you know, oh, they're still holding that body. And I don't uh, you know, the family is mm -hmm. complaining to the mm -hmm. news media that they, that, they, that they want some closure. They, under what sort of circumstances can you, can you go more than the 72 hours? We would. Uh, I, I don't see any circumstances where that would be needed. I mean, if you haven't got all your evidence by then, then. Uh, so that's uh, a pretty rare event. Yes, that would be, that would be rare. Okay. And also we have to, sometimes we're, we're in conflict because there's some religions that require burial by the next sunset. And so we have to deal with the uh, seeking of justice, but still trying to, to appease a family whose religious mm -hmm. belief yeah, says that. Do? I guess that's uh, Jews and, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, Muslims, Muslims too? Mm -hmm. So, and we will, we will do everything we can, uh, you know, to accommodate that, that particular religion, as long as we aren't messing up the criminal investigation. That has to be paramount. That's your number one thing is, Let's make sure that we're not rushing to judgment. Let's make sure we've got everything that we need to have and then release the body. Mm -hmm. Are there any areas that I haven't covered here that you think uh, needs, uh, well, needs it, to be it's talked important. about? Yes, it's important to, to note that. We just not, we're not reactive, we're proactive. It's the job of the coroner to go out and educate and tell people, hey, this is what's causing people to die. And, 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 and uh, right now in Madison County, we have a heroin problem, a horrible hero heroin problem. Uh, in 2008, we had five heroin deaths. In 2009, we had seven. Last year, we had 18. This year, we are already looking at 15, plus we have five pending toxicology cases. So if those come back positive, which we believe that they will, we're already at 20 heroin deaths. Which was what, what age group are we talking about? Every age group, from 18 years old to 60 years old, to lower middle class to super upper middle class. Uh, it, it goes across all social strata. There's nobody that's exempt from this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's getting popular in the high schools. Uh, used to be a stigma about, oh, heroin, you know, was that flop house, the rubber tubing, the shooting up. Well, now they're sniffing it, so it's kind of cool. You know, they think this is neat. It's kind of like the cocaine. Uh, so it's attractive. The thinking? I mean, when, when, when you and I were young, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it was like, you know, one shot and you're good for the rest of your life. I right. mean, that, 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 was the, that was our impression of heroin. Mm -hmm. well, what is the thinking that this, uh, uh, by the way, we're, we're down to about four minutes left here. Um, 
what, what kind of thinking, or is there any thinking <laughs> going on that says, yeah, oh yeah, just heroin, it's only heroin. It's, it's experimental. It's what's, what's the rush that am I going to get? Uh, it's cheap. It's like $10 for a button, for a hit. It's easy to find. Uh, $10 and, for, uh, mm -hmm. for a button, they call it a button. Uh -huh. And that's, that's This is the hit. thing you see where they cook it and, mm -hmm. or, or they can or snort, it, snort, snort it through straws. And that's the main thing or I yes. mean, rather than injecting? Yes, right now, and right now that's the popular thing. But here's the, here's the problem. Kids are gonna snort it, it's kind of cool. And they think that that's all that's ever gonna happen to them. This is a stream, extremely addicting drug. Drug. You only need to take it one time and you can actually start getting hooked on it. Uh, there was a study done where they took 100 people in to a one-year lockdown rehab facility. They were heroin addicts. One-year lockdown rehab, 100 people. Out of that 100 people, 96 went back to heroin after a one-year lockdown on rehab. That shows you how, ex how extremely addicting this drug is. And after a while, the snorting will not give you the same high, and then you'll go to the needle. Mm-hmm. It, it, you're going to go to the needle and then at some point in time you're going to become a client of mine and this is what we're trying to tell these ch children again there's more to the coroner's office than being reactive not waiting for the death to happen and responding my office is proactive in that we are going into to the middle schools the high schools uh, i go to rotary clubs you, you yourself go yes. to these places yes we're trying to educate these people right now I went to a Rotary Club last, last month, and we're, we're trying to tell parents, listen for these terms, buttons. You may think they're talking about a button missing from a coat. Uh, and look for the, the, the signs of, of heroin use, which is lethargy, uh, grades dropping off, this sort of thing. In fact, we've actually made, or in the process of making a, a DVD uh, through the, that we're gonna be able to uh, afford to the school systems in Madison County to show middle school and high schoolers uh, about the, uh, the, the, the uh, hazards of, of, of experimenting with, with heroin. The tape is going to show parents of, of, of children who have died from it. It's going to be a powerful uh, DVD once it's uh, uh, finished. What uh, about uh, methamphetamines? Or? You know, uh, drugs are cyclical. You know, uh, for a while, meth was, was your popular drug. We were having a lot of, of deaths there. Then fentanyl, these fentanyl patches. The kids were, were taking these patches, were, which were meant to be time release, and they were just mixing it and taking it all at once. So we were having a lot of fentanyl deaths a couple of years ago. For some reason, this becomes cyclical. But right now, our problem is heroin. Mm -hmm. And we are out there trying to educate the public and, and, and warning them to stay away. The other thing that became popular are bath salts. Uh, and they were, they were being sold in liquor stores. Now the bath salts were, uh, we've had two deaths in Madison County from overdosing on bath salts. Uh, a lot of the cities immediately responded to it, did some ordinances, banned the sale of those things. Now that's a sad note, but uh, um, we're out of time. I want to thank, we're going to have to have you back and talk further about this. I want to thank you very much for being with us today and uh, coming and speaking about your role as the coroner of Madison County. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And to my audience, uh, I've been speaking with Steve Nunn. He is the coroner of Madison County. Uh, if you have any further questions, be sure to call or contact their office. The rest of you, we'll see you next week. Thank you.